Ladies and gentlemen, her. Can you even, like, see them? No, you can't fucking see them. They're see-through. I'm going to, like, stick... Wait a minute. There. Looks great. If the show isn't going to bring the heat, then I guess I have to. No, use a bell. No, take the... Set design. This video has been a hard one to write. I first watched Fate, A Wink Saga, when it came out, and I had mixed feelings. Then I proceeded to spend just tens of hours consuming original Wink's content, and I even wrote a whole video about how much it means to me. And then I rewatched Fate, and now <laughs> my feelings are mixed in a different way. And I got very annoyed. I'm not gonna give a synopsis of the show as the video is already quite long. Just all you need to know for this video to make sense is that the story is about Bloom, who at 16 discovers she's a fairy and goes to magical school Althea, run by headmistress Farah. There she meets the rest of the Winks, Aisha, Musa, Terra, and Stella. There's also bad boy Riven and lover boy Sky and possible gay Dane and evil hot girl Beatrix, who works for ultimate evil lady Rosalind, who is trapped inside Althea for committing a lot of murder. There's a third of the burn ones, creatures who look like this and can kill very easily, that have started to appear since Bloom came back. Ooh, might that be related? Watch and find out! Fairy school Althea has a magical barrier that they can't break through. Bloom discovers her human parents aren't her biological parents and that she's a changeling, a fairy baby swapped with a human baby at birth. She wants answers. That's all you need to know for this video to make sense. Part 1. Here's why I care about this way too much. When I was a kid, I loved the Winx Club. The show and the comics, my friends and I would play pretend as the Winx girls. I was always Bloom, my favorite. It was super important to me growing up. Like, it was one of my special interests in my childhood. As one does, I outgrew it and moved on to other shows, but it always stayed with me, so much so that when I was 18, I got a tattoo of Bloom's wings on my right wrist. And I even named my cat after Aisha. So it's that serious. I only ever liked the first three seasons though. Like after that, it felt like the show was kind of losing its soul. It went from this cute fairy cartoon that was supposed to run for three seasons, according to the creator, Igneous Trafi, to a big brand with loads of merchandising and spin-offs that just looked boring and uninspired to me. The characters stopped looking like themselves and they whitewashed Flora and Aisha to oblivion. Does that sound familiar? So my attitude toward new wing stuff was always going to be of caution and distrust, but also genuine hope that it would be something good that represented what the original Wings Club truly was. Therefore, when I first started to see rumors about the Netflix live action, I was both kind of hopeful but also expecting the worst. We've seen Netflix taint other intellectual properties before. <sighs> Riverdale. But The Winx Club, as imperfect as it was, had so much potential for a good live action. There was so much that the live action could have taken inspiration from and built upon. The aesthetics and fashion of the original show are beautiful and modern and fit right in with the current fashion sphere. Every character was impossibly skinny, so now they could cast people from different body types because everybody can be a fairy, not just thin people. There was no queer representation in the cartoon, so that could have been something cool to add. The writing wasn't great, but the story itself had so much potential. And with a team of good writers who understood the core of the original show whilst placing it in a mature landscape, it really could have been something special. One thing the original show did right is the fairy transformations. With the technology available today, the transformation sequences could have been incredible, just otherworldly. This could have been monumental, just a shift from the gritty, shocking teen dramas that Netflix keeps pumping out. It could have been adored. I was ready to turn a blind eye to whatever mess it featured and love it, because it's the Winx Club. So, January of 2021. Fate, a Wink Saga came out, and it wasn't great. Part two, but first, what is Fate? Fate, the Wink Saga is a teen drama series based on the animated series Wink Club. It was developed by Brian Young, who is also the showrunner and executive producer. Apart from Molly Quinn, who is the voice actress for Bloom in the cartoon's American version, and Rainbow's Joanne Lee, who was an executive producer, Rainbow being the company that made the Wings Club, the entire crew is new to the Wings franchise, and the writers were recruited from teen dramas like The Vampire Diaries. And it shows. Here are some of my first impressions. It looks boring. I don't need to tell you that. The color palette is dark and earthy tones, nothing to do with the bright, colorful cartoon. Apart from everyone being beautiful, not much draws your eye to the screen. It's always cloudy, their clothes are basic and the colors don't stand out. Even the magic isn't super eye-catching. Like, it looks realistic. Like what elemental magic or bending would look like, but 
I don't want realistic magic. I want big, shiny, sparkly magic. Talking about magic, there were no fights, basically. A big part of the cartoon were the fights against the baddies, and they were awkward and weirdly paced, but they were still fun to watch. I wanted a couple of big standoffs between the fairies and the burned ones, or maybe even witches, but there was none of that. A couple small standoffs and that final bloom scene with the burn ones, but that's it. Transformations. I'm a huge Magical Girl anime lover, and the Wings transformations were heavily influenced by Magical Girl anime. This could have saved the show for me. Just look at these. They're incredible. They're from 2004, and I'm still obsessed with them. In the beginning of the show, the headmaster of fairy school Farah tells main girl Bloom that transformation magic was lost, which made me go, oh, okay, that's gonna be a thing. And it was. And I didn't need to see a fairy transformation if she was still gonna be wearing jeans. Fairy wings plus jeans is my villain origin story. The only worst thing would be denim fairy wings. Take me to hell, boys. She's also wearing a leather jacket. And the wings are just made of fire. It's just lazy. They sought out to make fairy wings the most uninspired, boring way possible. But it's not all bad. Here's a few things that I really like. I like that there's fairies and specialists of all genders, it's not divided like in the cartoon. I really like how when the fairies do magic, their eyes glow with the color of the magic. I thought that was a cool touch. And I really like Beatrix as a character. I think she gets some of the best lines in the show. I like in the first scene when Riven says that gingers are good shags. Kill me. And Sky says, oh, I didn't know your right hand was a ginger. <laughs> I thought that was funny and it made me laugh. Is that it? There's probably a couple more things. Part three, whitewashing and POC erasure. Before anything else, we need to talk about the casting, specifically whitewashing. In a 2011 interview with the website Iodon, Straffi talks about the human inspiration behind each Winx. Britney Spears for Bloom, Cameron Diaz for Stella, Pink for Tecna, Beyonce for Aisha, Jennifer Lopez for Flora, and Lucy Liu for Musa. Somehow, these two women were cast as Flora and Musa in the live action. Well, not quite. Apparently, according to showrunner Brian Young, this is Tara, Flora's white cousin. Is this any better? No. What you're saying is that you've replaced a Latina character with a white character. How is that any better? I want to reference a couple people that know a lot more than me about this because it's very necessary to talk about, and as a white person, it's not my voice and opinions that should be given priority in this matter. In her review of the show for the website, <laughs> The Mary Sue, Lyra Hell says, As a Latina, this news made me mad. When I found out that she had been replaced by Elliot Salt's character Terra, a white character with similar powers, I was even more mad. Just to clarify, I wasn't mad at the body positivity that I saw. That's always grand to see, and I'm a big girl myself. What I was mad about is that the show decided that Latinx people like me didn't matter. So why bother paying attention to that aspect of the character in adaptation? Fate the Wink Saga could have cast a thick Latinx woman to play Flora if they were looking for a combination of Latinx and body representation. Trust me, there are plenty of actresses out there that would love to play a fairy going to a magical school for the gifted. Instead, Netflix completely erased Flora and replaced her for no reason. Having watched the series premiere of Fate the Wink Saga, I can say that Terra is a kind and brave young fairy, but I can't invest in her and this show when all I can think about is who she's replacing. Full review in the description, check it out. YouTuber Shirley Samoe had this to say about the whitewashing of the show. Musa and Flora are both played by white actors. And yeah, I'm gonna call her Flora because initially the writers casted this person as Flora. It's even shown in her acting portfolio, but after the whitewashing backlash, they quickly changed it to Tara, a completely new made-up character who is supposedly the cousin of Flora. The lengths these people will go to justify whitewashing is impressive. Each fairy is from a different planet and we can see in one episode that the planet where Musa is from looks extremely Asiatic. East Asian architecture and traditional Asian clothes can be seen everywhere and when I was re-watching some Wings episodes and when I saw that I was like, shit, that would have been so cool to see in a live action show, you know, like a whole magical Asian planet, like are you kidding me? That would have been amazing. Flora is from Latin descent and if you look at her skin color it's very tanned almost caramel in the first few seasons it almost looks like Aisha and Flora are at the same skin color range like she always you should have been played by someone who is either mixed or a tan Latina and Musa yeah what can I say you already know it's an awesome video that you should definitely watch her whole channel is great she also talks about some casting decisions she would have made, some fashion stuff that she would have also done with the show, and it's just a great video. It's worth mentioning that I've seen people being fat phobic when calling out the whitewashing of the show. Tanisha Tekerwell makes a great point about this for the website Chaos Comrades. Many are also noting that there are people who are using the argument of whitewashing to mask their fat phobia. While these are certainly legitimate claims, it raises another concern. Plus size and BIPOC are not mutually exclusive categories of representation. The creators did not need to change the ethnicity of a character or 
or create a new white character for plus size representation when they could have easily cast a plus size actors of color. These trade offs perpetuate the harmful ideas that diversity and representation need to come in neatly packaged boxes that cannot overlap because that will be too many oppressed identities in one. This kind of attitude is what brings us primarily white lesbian characters or only cis gay men. It's a great article and I recommend you read the whole thing. In an interview with The Guardian, showrunner Brian Young said, according to the look of the wings in the cartoon, nobody looks like that. It was the most important thing to me that every kid can feel like they see themselves in it. Real girls, real people. But not all kids can see themselves, Brian. Latino, Latina, and Latina kids can't see themselves. East Asian kids can't see themselves when in the cartoon, they could. Igneous Stuffy said about the girls that the cartoon was designed so that every kid could see themselves in it. How did a show from 2004 do representation better than one from 2021 based on that original show and in the second season you just got renewed for what are you gonna do to fix it part four friendship in a promotional video for netflix island brian young says i always talk about this show as the origin story of a friend group it was important to me that the core idea of friendship was present in this version of the show because that's what Winx is. I was surprised when I heard this because when I was first taking notes for this video, this was something I wrote a lot about how the original show was about friendship and how I thought the live action had not replicated this at all. Let's talk about this. In the cartoon, the girls move as a group. They all get their individual storylines, they have their love interests, and sometimes one of them will leave to do something on their own. Like when Bloom goes to Dragon Island to get stronger, or when Aisha is in her home planet Andros trying to save it. She later does get help from her friends though. But they always go back to each other and rely on each other for emotional support, and help with their individual struggles, and just plain old gal pal times. They go have drinks together, they go shopping, help each other pick outfits, and just hang out. We see them bonding and becoming closer, and any discussions or disagreements they may have always get solved and end up with their friendships getting stronger. It's palpable how much they love each other. I got generally sad watching the cartoon because I haven't seen some of my closest friends in over a year due to the panoramic, and seeing these girls be so close reminded me of my friends. That's how well their friendship is established. But fate doesn't do this. The girls who are lucky enough to get their own storylines, more on that later, often move on their own or in pairs, and we barely ever see them interact as a group. And even when they do, they quickly get separated, like when they go to the party. In that same episode, there's actually a scene I really like, of Terra trying to do winged eyeliner but not being very good at it and getting help from Aisha and Bloom. They have a laugh, and it's a generally good scene that I definitely related to. How many times have I been getting ready with friends, just doing our makeup together and having a good time? It was a good scene. More of this, please. But we barely get anything else like it. It's mostly Bloom doing her own thing, making selfish decisions and ignoring her supposed friends. I don't even know if she likes them. She for sure tries her best to ditch them constantly and isn't honest with them most of the time. Then you have Musa dating Tara's brother behind her back for some reason, Stella straight up making it clear she doesn't like them and being mean to them whilst hanging out with a different group of people entirely, and Aisha just being there to further Bloom's storyline and not getting any of that energy back. So much more on that later. Tara also tries so hard to establish friendships but she barely ever gets taken seriously. At the end of the season they all more or less get together and we're supposed to believe like they're friends now. How? We haven't seen them get close or do anything as a group. So when they're all, except Aisha, more on that later, acting together in the end, it doesn't feel end. Because we haven't seen them bond and actually become friends. Any bonding that happened was off camera and that's useless. In a show about friendship, the friendship can't be off camera. There was time for more scenes like the makeup one. We didn't need to see so much of Beatrix and Riven being horny for each other. We didn't need all the mess with the love triangle between Stella and Sky and Bloom. We could have had more scenes that showed the girls actually becoming friends. But no, we had to just have messy drama that goes nowhere instead. In an interview with Precious Mustafa, who plays Aisha, and Elliot Salt, who plays Tara, they were asked this question. If you get the opportunity to further explore these characters in the future, what would you like to see more of? Precious says, I'd love to do more scenes with the girls. Season one follows the girls individually at times, or sometimes two of them at a time. I think it'd be really nice to develop these friendships. And Elliot adds, it's similar for me too. I'd like to see all of our relationships develop. And you might say, there are moments where the characters get to know each other. What about when Bloom tells Aisha her backstory? Or when Musa tells Sarah her backstory? Or when Stella tells Musa her backstory? Do we see a theme here? Yes, the sharing of the sad parts of your life can lead to becoming closer and eventually a friendship, but the show uses it instead of actual character development. 
Aisha saves Bloom from almost burning down the forest, and Bloom is mad about it, won't thank her or apologize to her for almost burning her down, and to justify this shitty behavior, she tells her her sad backstory of when her parents were mean to her so she almost burned them to death, as if it justifies any of her shitty behavior. Musa isn't nice to Tara, so to justify this, she tells her that she did that because her powers are hard to wield and she really struggles. She is a mind fairy who constantly feels the emotions of everyone around her. The moment where she tells her this is framed as a start of a new friendship, but in the rest of the show, Musa goes on to make a few comments about Tara that indicate she doesn't really like her and it never really gets better than that. Stella is a mean girl. She's rude, dismissive, stuck up and selfish. Then we learn that her mom, the queen of the land, treats her badly and that she's under a lot of pressure. This doesn't justify her actions, her rudeness and all the apologies she never gave. We learn this and the show moves on like it's all okay now. She's forgiven for being a bad friend. Stream Bad Friend by Rina Sawayama. But again, it's not and nothing has happened to warrant this redemption. Having a shitty mom doesn't excuse you being a shitty person. This is huge in the show. Characters will do bad things and make selfish decisions and never consider how it would affect others, but it's okay, because they've had it rough. They're struggling. And this brings me to Bloom. Part five. Bloom, please understand the world doesn't revolve around you. There's a problem when the main character of a show is unlikable when she's not intended to be. I'm not rooting for her. What she wants, answers about her biological parents since it turns out she's adopted, is understandable. But the way she goes about it is all wrong. It's all she cares about. She never shows interest in her friends' lives. And she'll ditch them the first chance she gets to go get answers. She's hard to relate to. Even though the show spends a lot of time on her, we barely ever get to see into her mind. You never know what she's thinking. There'll be moments when she realizes something and she goes on to do whatever she's thinking about, but it's so poorly conveyed to the viewer that it's hard to care about it. Bloom chooses to put the lives of everyone in school in danger just to go free a woman who committed genocide so she can tell her who her parents are. People almost die because of this. Is this someone I'm supposed to be rooting for? I don't really care where she comes from because I don't like her, so the main plot point is just a waste of time for me. I'd rather see the girls be friends, like in the cartoon. This is actually sad for me because Bloom was my favorite since day one, and seeing her character be treated like this, it's upsetting. I do love the moment where Bloom and Sky are having a little romance and Sky tells her he's a fixer and we're all broken Bloom and they kiss and then he immediately starts to lose consciousness because she's drugged him because she doesn't want him to stop her from freeing the evil woman. Incredible. Ugh, fuck. Okay. Part 6. Terra and Fat Phobia. As I mentioned earlier, the cartoon had a big problem when it came to body inclusivity. Everybody looked like this. So when I saw that they cast Elliot Salt as Terra, I got really excited on the body representation part because they were attempting to correct this. But then they go and make Terra the butt of every fucking joke. There are two instances of clear fat phobia toward Terra in the show. In the first one, Riven says that Terra is three people in one. Weird thing to say. Terra has a little monologue about what being a big girl is like and chokes him with magical plants and I love it. Could have been handled better, but I enjoyed seeing Riven all scared. But the second instance annoys me so much. On Beatrix's Insta story, why do they have Instagram? Riven calls Terra a fat bitch, using the neutral term fat as derogatory. And Dane doesn't defend her and instead says she can go fuck a flower. She sees this and is obviously very upset, especially since Dane and her were close friends and she had a crush on him. Which, by the way, Cool to have your fat character have an unrequited crush. Never seen that one before. Nothing wrong with that trope. So after this, I was waiting for her to have a bonding session with her friends where they talk about it and they make her feel better. And I was also hoping that she'd get apologies and there would be some sort of consequence for Riven, Dane and Beatrix. But we get none of that. Dane gives her a lazy apology and she dismisses it. Good on her. But later, she and Riven have a scene of emotional vulnerability where Riven expresses his frustration about not being a good enough specialist and she makes him feel better. There's no acknowledgement of what he did from either of them. Why is she comforting him? He's been treating her like shit from episode one solely because she's fat. Fuck this scene. She gets no apologies, no comfort from her friends, no consequences. And you know her friends know because they confront Dane about it. Would have loved to see the moment where they talk about it with Tara, you know? Like friends do? This is not how you handle your only fat character dealing with fat phobia. If you're gonna have characters with marginalized identities, you have to treat them with the care they deserve. Inclusivity isn't enough. Their representation has to be on par. Terra deserved better. Oh, and her friends act as if she's annoying and too much. There's so much I could say about that, but all I'm gonna say is no. 
No, don't do that. Part seven. Aisha deserved the world and y'all gave her nothing except being Bloom's bestie and I am gonna fight all of you. So as the title said, Aisha got paid dust. Cartoon Aisha was a really cool character. She was the princess of Andros, an awesome fighter and dancer and the storyline of how she's introduced is generally so cool and you should watch it. The story of her getting her enchantix powers is probably the best one of them all. In the live action, we know two things about her. She swims twice a day and she once flooded her school with shit water. Great. In the interview I referenced earlier in the friendship section, Precious also says this about getting to play Aisha in the future. For my character specifically, I'd love to know why she's Althea, her background, and why she is the way that she is. Reading this was like being hit by a train. The fact that this is something that the actress of the character has had to say makes me so sad and angry. It's true. We know nothing about her. Every other Winks, we get to know about them and their families and their powers and they get storylines and love interests. But everything Aisha does is related to Bloom, specifically helping Bloom. The very first scene she's in, she saves Bloom from a FaceTime call with her parents. The one thing she does that could be her own thing, being Farah's assistant, she does to spy on her for Bloom. She's basically the black best friend trope and I hate it so much. Precious is a great actress. She does an awesome job with how little she is given. And having seen how cool and special cartoon Aisha is, I see so much wasted potential with her character here. And it's not just that her character is paid dust in terms of individuality and characterization, but she's also treated so frustratingly by her friends in the story. There's many moments where Bloom is dismissive or rude, totally uncalled for. But what angered me so much was toward the end of the season. Beatrix has killed someone and so she's in jail basically. Bloom wants to go free her so she can in turn help her free Rosalind, the genocide lady, so she can give her answers about her parents. This premise is already so annoying and Cartoon Bloom would have never done that. She would have never been that selfish and stupid. After Stella tells Musa her sad backstory, obviously everything's free given, so she and the rest of the girls, except Aisha, go help Bloom free Beatrix. Aisha doesn't think it's a good idea and anyone with half a brain soul can see she's right. Stella tells Aisha she's betraying Bloom and that she's a bad friend. Stella, ¿qué cojones tienes, hija? Aisha then goes to tell Farah about what the other wings are doing, as someone who doesn't want to free two murderers would, and she's again told by Stella that she's a bad friend. Due to the girl's actions, the burned ones infiltrate the school and a supporting character almost dies. And no one apologizes to Aisha. No one recognizes she was right. It's framed like she acted wrongly, like she should have helped free Rosalind. But that's just not the case. You wanted this to have been the case? Write this story better. Aisha deserved so much more and so much better and she better be getting a fuck ton of backstory and plot lines of her own in the second season, I swear to god. I have a few things to say about the other winks, but they don't war in separate sections, so I'm gonna do a speed round. Stella. You all took a girly, fashion-loving loud girl and turned her into a two-faced rude bitch. Be thankful I'm of average height and can't fight. Musa. Her powers remind me of autistic hyperempathy and therefore I see her as autistic and I like her. Tecna. Where is she? Where is she? Part 8. Swear words and shocking reveals don't equal good writing. Look, I understand this isn't a show for kids. It's an adaptation of a show for kids made for young adults. That doesn't mean that I was ready to hear someone who is supposed to be this guy ask someone who is supposed to be this guy if he's with someone who is supposed to be this girl because she lets him fuck her in the ass. She must be mind blowing, right? Or does she do weird shit with her tongue? What are you talking about? I'm just trying to figure out why the fuck you started things up with her again. Like, she's crazy hot, yeah, but the emphasis is squarely on crazy. It's butt stuff. <laughs> she lets you do butt stuff. Shut up, Riven. I've never been a teen boy, so I don't know if they act the way Riven does. But it still feels like the writers were just trying too hard to make him a bad boy who says gross, shocking shit. Not to say that comments like that are inherently gross and that sex should never be talked about. Absolutely not what I mean. Please talk about sex in shows. It's fun. I think it's cool. Talk about sex in general. It's healthy to do that. What I'm trying to say is that these comments felt shoehorned in. They weren't organic. I say a lot of that kind of stuff myself. I just like to think that it makes sense in the conversation. I guess my friends can decide that better than I can. Riven in the cartoon is rude and he makes morally dubious choices. So his character arc in the first season of the cartoon where he kind of joins the dark side and then realizes his mistakes and grows from that and becomes a better person it's really satisfying. But here in the live action, he's just a guy making up for how little sexual experience he actually has. And he goes from that to that. But he's kind of maybe evil now. And also homophobic, maybe. The gay conversation is a messy one we'll have later. Reveals. They're fun. Once or twice per season. Bloom almost burned down her parents. Okay. She's actually a changeling. 
cool. Rosalind did it. Oh, but she's dead. Oh, no, no, she's alive, actually. Farah and the other teachers committed genocide. They're actually innocent, and it was all Rosalind's doing. Oh, and Silva killed Sky's daddy. Oh, and actually, he's not dead and he also is evil now. These aren't bad ideas, even though it gets to a point where it's like, okay, we get it. It's just that these things happen at the characters, not with them. There's just no payoff from these reveals because they fall flat. The characters don't grow. They now know more things, but there's almost no change in who they are as people. I just feel like these reveals are being used in the place of character growth, and that's just not enough to keep me engaged. Part nine, gay. Earlier, I mentioned that the show was an opportunity to bring some queer rep into the Wings cinematic universe. And it kind of tries to do that, I think. I mentioned Dane earlier. He's supposed to be gay? Or maybe bi? I don't know. He never talks about it or even says the word gay. He's seen looking at Riven longingly and he stalks his Instagram. The one that does say the word gay is Riven regarding Dane in a not very nice way. He mentions it to Beatrix, who calls him a homophobe, but that's as far as she goes, taking a stance. She needs him for her evil plan, I guess. In the last episode, after teasing Dane about it through the season, he asks him straight up, Are you gay? <laughs> I know when someone wants my dick. Dear men loving men, is this how straight guys talk to you sometimes? If so, I'm so sorry. And Dane answers, I think you're hot. She, Beatrix, is too, in a different way. Riven does seem to be interested in him, just not sure if it's in a gay way. Is this queer baiting? Is this baiting the queers? I do feel a bit baited. When I saw Dane looking at Riven in the first episode, I was like, oh, sick, a fellow gay. Excited to see how this develops. And then it just didn't develop into anything. Oh, and why would you add homophobia to a fantasy setting? Is it so unrealistic that in a dimension separate from Earth, Homophobia just never happened. People can do magic, but being gay is where we draw the line. Same thing goes for fatphobia. These two things happened in our world due to white supremacy and colonization. So did that also happen in the Wing Cinematic Universe? They didn't have to exist here. If they do, it's because the show wanted to address them. And if you're going to address these things, do it properly or don't do it at all. I'd much rather see a gay character and a fat character just existing and using magic and fighting. We don't get enough stories of marginalized people just existing. And a magical universe would be perfect for this. I don't think I'm gonna count this as gay rep. I was a teenager not so long ago. I remember how scary it was to even say that I liked girls. So I'm not saying this isn't like realistic, but it just doesn't feel like he was treated with the care that it deserves. Some of Riven's comments about Dane's sexuality were just unnecessary. Just another shocking thing for him to say so that we know that, yeah, he's not a good guy. Dane never got to be the one to talk about it. He was cornered by Riven and had to give him an ambiguous answer. There's a line he does say to Bloom about how he loves Beatrix because she accepts him for who he is. And I guess that could be taken as him addressing his gayness in like a Lacroix kind of way, but that's not enough for me. I've been watching The Bold Type, where my girlfriend Kat Edison has a beautiful, clear, unambiguous journey with realizing her bisexuality. She talks about it, she dates, sleeps with, and loves different people, and decides that the label bisexual fits her best. I won't be accepting anything less than that anymore. This show has raised my gay rep standards. You should watch that show, it'll surprise you. Thanks a lot, Nitu, for recommending it to me. Part 10. There is no universe in which this can be considered the Winx Club. There's more light in my room now. What makes a good live action adaptation? How similar should it be to the source material? Should it be a carbon copy, but with real people this time? Or should it just stray and be its own thing? But how far should it stray though? I'm not the first person to say this and I won't be the last. There's been a rise in live action adaptations in the last few years. Our childhood nostalgia is being commodified to oblivion. No one is safe, not even the Powerpuff Girls. This sucks because we're not really getting original stories anymore. Why invest in new ideas from young creatives when we could just make a mediocre live action of something that already has a fan base? Hot take. Capitalism is bad, actually. It doesn't breed innovation in any way, shape or form. It takes humanity out of media and we should get rid of it. As I said in the beginning, in the sea of soulless live action adaptations, I actually thought the Wings Club had a shot. It had a good premise and story areas that needed work and a more grown-up version that dealt with the issues of young adults whilst being fairies and fighters was a really exciting premise and had a lot of potential but 
we didn't get that. I feel like the writers wrote the show after being told the story of the original by someone who watched it years ago and doesn't remember it very well. I think they took like a couple things. Bloom finding out at 17 that she's a fairy and wanting to fight her birth parents. The friend group existing. Riven being kind of a dick. The tricks as antagonists and the monsters from season one and just run away with it and added typical teen drama shit like love triangles and reveals. It doesn't feel like this was made by someone who understands stands and appreciates the Wings Club that loves the original and wanted to build upon it. Only two people in the crew worked in the original show. Everyone else had little to nothing to do with it. No, they had nothing to do with it. They took the names of the characters and locations and emptied them of what made them them. It's silly to have someone named Sky neg someone named Bloom in the first scene. And being told these are the people and story that you fell in love with as a kid, look. And being sold this. It upsets me and my homegirl, especially after rewatching the cartoons and rereading the comics. It's almost funny to like put them side by side and think these are supposed to be related somehow. This isn't the Wings Club. It would have been better if you just changed the names and made something new entirely. I am disappointed. I see the wasted potential that this show has and I just, I get sad. I guess I'm biased because I loved the original Wings Club, but isn't that? who this was for, people who watched it as kids and loved it. I can only hope season two addresses some of these problems and maybe even fixes them and is better. I'll be watching. Maybe I shouldn't, but I have hope. I just really care about this for some reason. I know it could have been good. I saw it, like, it was all there. <laughs> it was all there and it just wasn't good. And seeing what we got is sad and very very disappointing i love the wings club and i just wanted to say something and i'd love to make that video about it i wrote alongside this one someday gonna go write a video about tokyo ghoul and stream sour now thanks for watching bye